Hey guys, Joel Pye here at Advanced Innovations. Welcome back to my shop. The next pieces I'm going to attack are the box bed and the sole plate. This is the foundation of the build right there. This goes onto this and everything else goes onto that. Any questions? Thank you for watching. Only kidding. <laughs> all right, just like anything else, got to start with a file. Knock all the ugly off of this. Blast it if it needs blasting and then we'll clamp it down, pop some holes in it. Should be pretty straightforward. Except for where the crank journals go through, that is going to take some thought. It's either going to be done with a ball end mill or by uh, osmosis, magic wand kind of stuff. But we'll have to see when we get there. Probably a ball end mill is going to be the best bet here. Probably. All right, let's break out the files, sit on the bench for a little while, take off the gates, clean up the bottoms, take and clean off all the windows. Just make it look like something that will look even better once some type of paint is applied. And I probably will paint it. Put it in the comment line. What color would you like to see this thing when it's done? I'm pretty much open for suggestions. Let's get to the files. This component here is relatively simple. There's really no dimensions given on this with the exception of a few holes. Actually, the holes out here aren't even dimensioned. Only the mounting holes for the standards, or excuse me, for the next piece of line. So all I'm going to do is just make sure that it sits flat, which it does not at the moment. File all the burrs off. Same thing with this one. I want this one to sit flat, and then we'll bring in the height, and we'll bring in all the other features on that as well. Got to get the wiggle out of it. Don't want anything binding up when everything gets tight. Now one suggestion I can give you with these particular parts, I know I'm going to be very cautious about how I mill the center out of this. There's a lot of material that's going to be coming out of here. And before I bring the whole thing to its nice, true, and flat, and dimensional configuration, I'm going to make sure that I rough as much material off of here as possible. If there's any leftover stress in this casting, which you would hope there wouldn't be, uh, it'll still fall in when it comes time to finish it up. I'm going to go off camera here for a little bit. Take the file to it. I will show you what it looks like when I'm done. We're going to work all the ugly out of this and get ready for some machine work. Stay tuned. Well, after investing some bench time and some blast cabinet time, all the flash lines have been removed from these castings. They are nice and clean. Inside and out. You can handle it without the worry of getting cut. And I think that's probably the good thing to do. They are very clean. New sand is working out real well. It's an aggressive black, black diamond sand. I really do like it. First thing I did on these guys, actually one of the things I did was make sure it didn't rock. Tap it down, sand it down, file it down, whatever. you got to have a flat surface to start somewhere, right? Now when I double check this, the outsides are bowed somewhat, so you really can't sit it down. You really can't squeeze it in a vise. I'm going to stand it up, and I'm going to register on the inside of one of these ribs, and I'm going to just create two little parallel surfaces 
on either end of this so I can clamp it in the vise and access all 10 holes from one setup. That'll be the first thing I do. So let's move over to the mill, stand it vertically, establish a couple of tracking edges, see how they look. Yeah, I still might not like it. Then I will re-blast it afterwards because I want it to blend. And that's how we'll do the 10 holes. Off we go. I've selected a parallel that I know is small enough to fit in between the radius features on either end of this rib. That is probably the straightest part of this. I'm going to take a nice dust cutter across the back and see what happens. And the rotation of the cutter is cutting clockwise, forcing the chips this way so I don't blow the back off this casting. I think it's plenty clear to see why you wouldn't want to squeeze on that. It would probably crack the casting or rock or both. I'm very pleased with the symmetry of that one. That's a nice one. All right. Deeper the edge, blast it, come back out. I'm going to deeper the edge, blast it, bring it back, and then we'll clamp it down to all the holes. After the blasting up, the cosmetic finish is just about, well, it's to my satisfaction. This model will be painted. I don't know what color I'm going to paint it yet, but it's nice to have the texture there so that doesn't stand out as a machine surface. I am going to gently dust this as soon as it goes back in the setup to make sure that it is flat for the mating part. And drill the holes. Preparation of the main base is probably the toughest part of this component. It's all just straightforward drilling and tapping. And I did take a fly cut across the surface to make sure it was flat. Now when you do something like that, uh, make sure the pressure on the part is not too extreme or the clamping from the ends will bow the top. You'll fly cut it and when you unloosen the vice pressure, it'll cave back in and you'll end up with a concave surface. So mild enough to hold it and tight enough to be confident. If you're going to get funny little shapes around the windows, it's because of the interruption of the fly cutter. And trust me, I got them too. Thank God for the blast unit. It erases them it's like they were never there. I took the liberty of spot facing the outer tabs. These are 540 Imperial threads. I just couldn't take any more metric today because I don't want to break out in a rash. These are the 7BAs. That's really small. Well, smaller than I thought it would be and quite different than conventional imperial numbering as the ba number gets higher the thread gets smaller i was surprised to see that caught me off guard anyway i'm gonna take it out wash it up and we'll take a look at it on the bench move on to the next component upwards the 
corners will mimic threaded studs coming up from the floor. There's a machine like this, I'm sure, it wasn't sitting on uh, feet. So these will, at assembly, not be cap screws. They will just be studs coming up through the bottom with the conventional 540 nuts on it. Next piece in line is this little guy right here. And that looks like this when we start. So just like any other casting, got to figure out what's uh, intended to be left behind, where the center is that you can't change, and go from there. The only feature on this that has any type of scratch-your-head merit, and it really isn't all that, is this channel that runs right through the center. It is a 7 16 completely round bottom trough, and the only way I'm going to be able to do that is with a special cutter. This guy right here. Yeah, sure, you little thing, isn't it? That is a four flute, seven sixteenths diameter, four thirty seven ball end mill. And that should give me the ability to just walk this right across the center of this part, actually, right across the center of this part, and form that trough right there. The casting that they give you that goes down in this feature is actually a seven sixteenths net shape, so we're going to make sure that fits before we go and click our heels. Just like the other one, all I did on this so far was to straighten up the bottom, set it on a surface plate, make sure it doesn't rock. Now I'm going to do a little mechanical inspection and see what needs to come down, mark it up as such, and get after it. Just like the last component I did, the first feature I will put on this uh, is a tracking surface in the back and one on the bottom because I intend to hold it so that the journal cuts are on the x-axis travel. So some very superficial cuts here and on the other side, clean it up, deburr it, then I'll lay it down. Uh, apparently there's a very superficial, maybe half a millimeter, 20 thousandths of an inch coming off of these surfaces. Everything else is net shape and we'll go from there. I am genuinely impressed with how square this surface is to the bottom. That's quite a feat for a casting. You would think there'd be some type of draft on it, but there isn't. I'm going to flip it over, do the same thing, and I'll blast it for texture, and we'll bring it back and sit it up vertical. Both sides milled, both sides blasted. Let's get it back in the machine and do some work on the top. And I know I'm going to get a question about this. Well, the other end says this. When I have a parallel or some parallels missing from a set. And it goes back under my toolbox. I know that this one doesn't have all of them, and I know that this one does. So when I fill it back up, I just simply turn it around and put it in there. With several machines and multiple vices in this shop, sometimes it's just a pain in the neck to not know what's going on. So there you go. Full on one side, partial on the other. Mystery solved. Moving on to the drilling operation, it's really nice when there's numbers on the print that you can dial your dials to hit, and when there's not, well, I guess that's a rabbit hole you're just going to have to go down. There are no numbers on these guys right here with the exceptions of the half-inch centers. So a half-inch hole the hole in four different places. The inch and an eighth off-center of course, that's no big deal because that matches the standard. But where is this? Where is this located? It is located on the center of the crank. This guy right here. So with all the dimensions that they give you, figure out what the center line is from journal to journal. And that is, in fact, what the center line is between these features right here. All right. Not a big deal, right? Let's go down to these dimensions right here. Uh, 1 in 2164 it's imperial that's 1 inch uh, 1.328 and if that's a fact the 1 inch 328 takes these holes off center on the actual casting they'll be closer to the outside 
than centered. And just because I'm a Virgo and I got to have it right, or at least look right, I'm going to put them in the middle and I'm going to back it down to 1 inch 295. That is the dimension that I'm going to hit. Well, when you do that, you may mess up the journal bearings that go in here because they're now going to pinch the crank, so be very careful. Very careful. Once you've got your 1 inch 406 set here, the standards go on, the heads go on, the cylinders go on, the steam cases, steam chests go on, and now you have to worry about ta -da, the center, the center distance on these pipes that are supposed to go up against the upper components on this model, and hopefully everything lines up. Well, unfortunately, I don't know if it's shrinkage or the way the pipe is bent or what the deal is, but these will not line up with the ports as dimensioned. And I know they look really distorted, but it's really not that bad. There's a little bit of tip, but you got to go down here for the dimension. Which leads us to the digital model that you need to create or a little bit of math that you need to do to figure out where you can cheat, what you can cheat, and uh, when you need to cheat it. I think the journal bearings are going to have to be fitted or fit at assembly to make sure that the crank is on center and everything lines up, pistons line up, crosshead lines up, and it doesn't slop back and forth. So we're going to put the holes on the center of these pads, center of these pads, and just take our lumps as they come. So that's the plan. It's going to look like the picture. And, you know, that is one of those things that you're inevitably going to approach one of your company engineers and say, hey, you want to like the print or you want to like the picture? You have to make up your mind. Well, in a model like this, being highly cosmetic and highly visible and knowing that there's somebody out there that's going to take a picture of the model and say, uh, what happened here? I'm going to put it on center. My model, my plans, right? Let's do that. Let's take a look at the model that I had to do in order to find out where these pipes fit. That was fun. There was some adjustments made on the cylinders and the steam chest in order to get these guys to go because they are different centers and they go on different sides of the model. Let's take a look at that. This is the digital model that was created to determine what adjustments needed to be made to what parts on this in order to get these factory pipes to fit. Now I could have cheated, I could still cheat and cut the pipes and splice the pipe in the middle and it really won't matter how far out they are or not because they'll just solder them once they get in place. But the cylinders need to be drilled, the steam chest needs to be drilled. And you can see how if they're not drilled properly, they're just not going to line up. The hole in the base that I'm going to adjust, I think I just went over that. Let me see if there's a scratch line right there. I don't know if you can see that line or not, but there is a line right there. Let's go to Ghost and adjust that. There it is. That particular gold line right there is the center of the boss, and you can see how far out the holes are. The holes are out about 30 thousandths of an inch if you want to center it. Print calls for 1 inch 328. I'm going 1 inch 295. It will move the hole over and put it there. Standards line up with the base now because the crank has been put in place. And i got to tell you, this may be a little overkill, but it's nice to have this capability. Crank actually spins on this model, too. So I can see whether or not the journals themselves will come around and be absolutely in the middle of the standard as required. And yes, they will. Spot on. I have the dimensions that I need. I have the changes made that I'm going to make. Let's get up back out to the mill and make this happen. It sure is nice to have this capability. That makes things a whole lot easier. And it's nice to kill some time when it's cold out in the shop and you just don't feel like running a machine. But that's coming to an end right now. Let's go drill some holes. For the duration of this particular machining operation, the camera is located to the left of the workpiece and behind the machine. So it's not on the operator's side. You are looking from behind the machine.
overall thickness is the only thing that matters. The height for the journals will be established from the bottom up. In order to find the center of the casting, I'm going to sweep the insides of the jaws and then just gently touch the outside and compare it to the reading on the inside for symmetry. I'm going to assume nothing at this point, but I know that I can sweep the jaws, get the center line for the y-axis, y-axis, the thickness of the ends and the thickness of the center, well, that's up in the air until you check it. Now on the off chance that there's any draft on the outside of this, I'm going to check the top as close to the top as I possibly can. I am very much opposed to using an indicator on a cast surface, but for this initial alignment, I think it's warranted. With the outside checked, I'll now check the symmetry without moving the table, just the indicator to see exactly how this is positioned to the overall casting. Center boss does have much more of a draft than the outside. It's about two thousandths of an inch off center. I'm going to stay with the outside casting and just go with it as is.
you may have noticed a rapid oscillation while I was approaching the material. And from my viewpoint, I can see the extended center drill pushing from side to side. A shorter center drill would certainly help that matter. But by pecking it, I can peck it until it wears away at the eccentricity of the precast dimple so that there is no deflection of the center drill. I don't know if that was clear from your angle, but that's why I did that. That was not a camera trick or a wiggle, uh, unintentional. These are the holes that hold it down to the main base to give the crank room to do its thing and the flywheel room to spin freely. If you're going to do this, make sure that your parallels are thin enough that when it breaks through the casting, it doesn't hit the parallel. This will be very close, and you'll be able to see that when I do this hole over here. I'm going to take a quick look at the blueprint and see exactly what type of feature goes on here at assembly and counter bore or spot face it accordingly. I'll be right back. The spot face that I've elected for the 7BA nut, and this is a full size nut, not a half nut, is 218. That's about 5.5 millimeters. Now these holes are 0 0.102, 102 imperial. Two point six millimeters through that is good if the threaded stud is completely threaded but if you're using a 7ba stud and it's threaded on a larger piece make sure you mic the non-threaded section or these 102 holes will not work so make sure the stud coming up through there is fully threaded or compensate the drill accordingly we'll spot face all six of these holes and then we'll put the slot in the center The center feature for the crank bearings will be done with a ball end mill. This is a 4 flute, 7 16 diameter, 437.5 diameter carbide end mill. That is just a little bit bigger than 11 millimeters. Now what they want is the center of the end mill, the center of the radius feature, to be 1 eighth of an inch below the top surface. Really not that hard to do. I'm going to use a tool bit of a known thickness, and I'm going to move the table up until the tool bit just encounters the bottom of the cutter. I am not going to leave the tool bit in place as the table comes up so I don't chip the cutter. tool bit will not pass underneath that cutter right now. It may if I push it, but I'm not going to push it. I want just a gentle encounter. I do not want to scratch anything, break any edges. I'm going to set my table zero right now. Back it off about three thousandths. Check it again. Two thousand. One. About a half. Very close to exactly what I'm looking for. Right there. Gotcha. 
Now at this point you raise the table the thickness of your tool bit or your spacer block and that puts the ball end mill right on this surface. Then you raise the table some more and it puts the center of the ball end mill on the edge or on the surface that you just registered from. Naturally that encounter, that move has to be the radius of the cutter. In this case it's 218. And then from that point you can just go down to the dimension on the print. So I'm going to go 250 down to get the bottom of the cutter to this plane. I'm going to go another 218 down to get this plane on the center of the radius. And then I'm going to go another 125 down to put the center of the radius 125 from the top surface. But move the cutter off center before you make any vertical moves. Man, I would hate to see you just smash this thing all to pieces. All right, here we go. First move is 250. Right now the bottom of the cutter is even with the top surface of the, of the part. I'm going to go 218 to establish the center. Ball center is now on the top plane. 125 for the dimension on the print. At this time, I am going to re-zero my Z-axis crank dial so that everything is zero. And I'm going to raise it up a little bit because I'm going to walk back and forth with this cutter, uh, not moving the cutter on the Y-axis. You are looking straight down the X-axis at this point, left to right. me let's do it Naturally, the edges of these cutouts are very sharp right now, and I can't trust that the edges of this particular casting are as sharp. So until this is deburred, there's really no way to tell if it's going to go in. It certainly feels like it's nice and smooth. I like that. And what you're seeing is a chamfer on the end of the bar here. If I were to bring it out a little further, it might look like it's got a little bit better fit. I like it. 
I say that a gentle deburr of these particular edges is going to do the trick, and if not, I'll take a sharp file to this particular casting right here, and that'll be the end of it. I think that's a wrap for today, guys. I'm not going to show all the tapping of the holes. What's the point? You've seen the logic behind the cut going down the center, the process, the decking of everything. And I think that's a wrap. I thank you for taking the time to watch this piece come to life. And I'll show the finished part in the beginning of the next video after it's all cleaned up and ready to present. Wherever you are in the world, I hope you're well and happy and safe in uh, no particular order, but all of the above. I'm Joe Pye here at Advanced Innovations in Austin, Texas. I'm out.